throughout the human history, migration has been a fundamental strategy for survival. People have always fled from natural disasters, wars, persecution, and poverty. Or more simply, people move in search of better living conditions for themselves and their families. Or to quote Francesca Mannocchi's words, they move just because they want to move. They would like to have the right to move. Migrations often represent uh, the end of a nightmare and the beginning of a new life, a new hope for those who migrate and the possibility to offer solidarity on the part of those who receive. So this encounter between uh, those in need and those who can help represents, according to us, the highest exp expression of what we humans can do. In the 19th century, millions of Italians migrated to Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and the United States to escape poverty. At the end of the Spanish Civil War, defeated Republicans were welcomed in Chile with the help of Pablo Neruda. Then, with the advent of Pinochet dictatorship, many Chileans, like Isabel Allende, were welcomed in Venezuela. Migration has often enriched the host countries, as demonstrated by the small country of Luxembourg from which we're speaking today, where immigrants make up 50% of the population. Migration is therefore a natural and a positive phenomenon if it is seen through the lens of humanity. Today, we are talking about migration with a great expert, the journalist Francesca Mannocchi, who has a profound knowledge of the dramas often faced by those who dare to undertake the journey. Before giving the floor to Francesca, we would like to show you a short video that Francesca shot in Libya. <laughs> Can I say something? Your embassy. Look at the level of the food. Let me show you. But do you, do you expect him to give you five? In the night, we eat one. We are dying. 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 We are Buried, not that we don't know where they are buried. There, we are crying every day. Please, we need a help. Please, if there's any way you and or anybody can help us to remove us from here, okay, let them take money. Let, let we, we give them money. Let them just risk, take us out. They say they don't need money. So, a big thank you to Francesca for sharing uh, this video. So, this is uh, just the first one. We will show more videos later on and more pictures.
So I give the floor to Francesca. Thanks, Robert, and thanks, Dosiane, and good evening. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and thanks for having me. Um, so just to give you an idea, um, this video um, is from 2017, the beginning of 2017. Uh, it was shot in um, Garian in Libya. And uh, this, this prison is one of the official detention centers in, in Libya. Uh, when I say official, I mean the, the, the ones officially uh, managed by the Ministry of Interior and the specific department of the Ministry of Interior of Libyan government, of, of Tripoli Libyan government, one of the two, uh, we will see later. Um, and uh, this was uh, the last time I, I, I was able to, to visit the detention center and then I was prevented for one year and a half, me like many other journalists, after uh, Italy signed the uh, famous memorandum of understanding with the Libyan government. Uh, after uh, our uh, then Gentiloni government um, signed the, the, the agreement in February 2017, uh, it was impossible for journalists to, to enter um, the prison and, and for many of us to, to get the visa to enter Libya for a long time. Uh, seems to be a paradox for us as Italian, but the first time I was able to enter again in a detention center was when Salvini was our Minister of Interior. And this is just to show how uh, history can be very, um, can become a paradox. So this is just to, um, to explain the video we, we just seen and, uh, and go to the, um, to the presentation we prepared. So what we talk about when we talk about migration, when we talk about migration and, and, the, uh, and the footage of uh, Garian Detention Center um, shows this, um, or acceptance, but the last and most important question is how many of us and how many among the people we know can still say to be able to help those in need? How many of us and the people we know can identify with those asking for help? And I would like to start this evening uh, starting from our language. For example, from the etymological root of the Latin word Os. The Latin word os, the Latin root os, generates at the same time the concept of enemy and generates the concept of hospitality. It means that the same etymological root generates the, the word hostis and the word hospes, so the guest and the enemy. And we I mean, we'll try together to answer some questions, but also to ask ourselves new questions, cross-referencing writers and philosophers and, and, and arriving in, in Libya and in other countries in the Mediterranean area, uh, such as Lebanon. But I would like to start from these bodies in the sea, because I think that these bodies and faces and ends impose questions on us. So they force us to ask ourselves if we can still say we are capable of hospitality and give real value to the lives we host. Because it's exactly, precisely in our ability to make room for the other, any other that unexpectedly knocks on our door that depends our degree of civilization and the capacity to build a new sense of community, a new sense of community. And, and I think the times we are living deserve really a new sense of community. So 
we said that the same etymological root can generate two opposite feelings, rejection or community or sense of community. And it's always up to the people decide which side to take. So decide if us becomes a guest or if it's us becomes hostile. And the first, the main crucial question is how the strangers who knock on my door asking for hospitality is similar to me. And again, starting from the language, from os and hostis and hospes. In the second century after Christ, Sextus Pompeius Festus describes the hostis as the one who was recognized with the same rights as the Roman people. And the Latin sentence was quaderant pari iure cum popolo romano. And to explain this, um, Sexus Pompeius Festus says that the, the, the verb ostire had the same meaning as the verb equare. But he was, he, she was a person who is recognized as having rights that are ours, pari iure. So we saw that the stranger, um, we saw how the stranger and over to ask difficult, very difficult question. And, and one of the questions we have today is, and I think the main question is, does the life of the man who is asking for help have the same value as mine? European policies of recent years, um, while trying to contrast illegal migration, have instead, in my opinion, reaffirmed the issue of inequality. Considering those people just from the point of view of their biological life, but not of their biographical life. So these lives were not lives to be known, but lives to be pushed back. The way we have to see the injustice they are living the injustice they come from. So let's try again to use numbers. Around the world in, in, in 2019, so the year before the pandemic, uh, there were 1 billion and 200 million transnational trips. Following the, the, the beautiful metaphor of uh, Professor Stefan Allievi, uh, which wrote these numbers and, and the numbers on, on tourism, in a beautiful book entitled uh, Migration, Let's Change Everything, uh, he wrote, if we consider 24 hours long the history of humanity, man was nomadic for 23 hours and settled for only one. So today, there is a piece of the world of which we are part two, which, for example, takes five hours of flight to reach a country in sub-Saharan Africa, and at the same time, there is another piece of the world that takes two years or perhaps more to cover the same distance in the opposite direction. There are many reasons behind this difference. And, uh, and one of the reasons we, I mean, for me as a journalist, we have difficulties in, in reaching people, in being empathic with people, is that in recent years, let's say uh, we can point to 2014, 2015, Migration in, in Central Mediterranean has been politicized before being understood. And this has turned the phenomenon into a constant emergency. It has transformed a natural phenomenon, which is nomadism, the, the movement of people, the right to move of people into a crisis to be solved rather than managed. Now, Francesca, the question we have is, do you see contemporary attitudes to migrants as being similar to other tendencies in our society? Are attitudes to foreigners the tip of the iceberg, symptomatic of general social trends? Um, I, I, can, I can answer on, on the experience I have of, I mean, of my life, which is not interesting, but of my work. Um, and, and I think the attitude that journalism uh, 
uh, is having in, in, this, in these years uh, shows that public opinion is pushed to have simple answer to complex question and to answer with emotivity much more than with a structured opinion. And of course, it seems a football game, no more a public debate. Here too, we try to help with other numbers. So, Turkey is the main host country with a total of 3.5 million migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Pakistan and Uganda each took 1.4 million people. Among the European countries, Germany is hosting uh, 900,000 uh, people. As the 2019 UNHCR report shows, Forced displacement today affects more than 1% of the world's population, 1 in 97. While the number of those who manage to return home continues to decline. So, the UNHCR data revealed that for the 80 million people on the move, which is the highest figure ever recorded, it's increasingly difficult to return home. And, and compare this data with the, with the past one. In, in the 1990s, an average of 1.5 million refugees managed to return home each year. In the last 10 years, the average has collapsed to about 380,000. A figure that testifies that today, the increase in the number of people forced to flee far exceeds that of the people who managed to find a solution. So, some data on people on the move. At least 100 million people have been forced to flee their homes in the last 10 years in search of safety inside or outside their countries. The number of people fleeing has almost doubled in the last 10 years. More than three quarters of the world's refugees, 77%, come from long-term crisis scenarios. More than 8 in 10 refugees, as we saw before, 85% are living in developing countries, usually in a countries bordering the one they fled from. Two thirds of the people fleeing abroad come from five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Myanmar. So we have seen through official data, that was what is perceived as an invasion by European public opinion is actually not. And that the vast majority of people on the move live in developing countries or in countries that have many structural problems. You mentioned Syria, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, and uh, all these countries uh, are, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, are uh, strongly affected by the um, aggressive policies of their neighbors. I think about Turkey, for instance. So they accept to repatriate migrants who do not come from the mainland. Having an asylum request answered can take a year, even two, in case of appeal. And if the people are waiting a response, cannot leave the islands and the flow um, doesn't stop, the islands are bound to explode, like now. Thus the islands become a bottleneck and the situation in the hotspot is unsustainable until the tragedies of recent months, like the Moria hotspot in Lesbos, uh, which has been destroyed by fire months ago. So, to face the crisis of uh, 2015, the European response, the strategy to cope with that phenomenon was an agreement with Turkey. Money in exchange for border protection, money in exchange for the externalization of borders. From a numerical point of view, the European strategy worked. Last year, an average of uh, 2,500 people arrived in Las Bosa Mons, much less than the 10,000 who arrive in a single day in the midst of the crisis in, in 2015. But people who have arrived on the Greek islands of Chios, Leros, Samos, Kos, and Lesbos, of course, are now trapped, blocked by the slowness and complexity of an asylum application procedure. 
months, years in which the lives of thousands of people remain suspended, waiting for an evaluation on an island that has become the frontier of Europe. So I take this opportunity to ask you another question from one of our friends, and it's about, uh, again, uh, European uh, policies. Uh, the reconstruction of the etymology of hospitality is interesting. However, the numbers of migration are high and resources limited. How many people can the European Union really be able to absorb? This is not, uh, um, unfortunately, a, a question that uh, I, I can answer. I started from the etymological root of uh, host for, for us. As it as Italians, the Latin words, just to show a contradiction, just to show that the language itself can contain the two opposite feelings, which are definitely normal, fear and acceptance. And, and the point is, which one is prevailing now in Europe and why? And this is my, and this is my role as a, as a journalist. I'm not, I'm not a politician. And, uh, and my duty is not to uh, produce, not to propose solution. It's my duty is to work with words. This is why I started with a word. And uh, um, as, as, I, as I said, words are my tools. And I think that the perception people have in Europe is determined by the use of words that sometimes is not proper. And the capacity of offering place in the labor market, the capacity of uh, offering integration to answer your to answer what your question, precisely depends on the capacity of having a long-term vision of the phenomenon. The problem is, I, I think, these are not numbers. Back to the beginning, to the starting question. Is the life of the people trying to get to Europe worth the same as mine? Am I still able to consider myself capable of hospitality? And I would add one more question with which I, I leave you. How much does the way in which we use words and therefore create our opinions make us responsible for the destinies of these people? How much do, how much the use of words lets the people become enemies instead of guests. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, I believe uh, we have uh, another, another uh, video to show. But before this, I would uh, ask you a question from uh, the more uh, concrete, uh, practical friends we have uh, this evening. They are asking uh, uh, more or less the same question. Uh, um, so the first one is asking, uh, what should we do? And the second is asking, uh, what is our job as citizens uh, to solve this um, uh, migration crisis? And the third one is more critical. He's saying that in his opinion, it is not a, an issue of wars, but it is a logistical and a political problem. Uh, and so we need answers. I can uh, start from the end uh, with a sentence of a philosopher I love, which is Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he said that words are actions. So I strongly believe that words are actions. Politics is made up of words, so everything is politics. Um, what can we do? Very happy for this question. Um, for years, I tried to, at the end of book presentation of, or meeting with the secondary school with, with, with students or with people, the book presentation, I always try to discuss with people what, what can we do? Uh, we need more or less civil society. We need more or less NGOs 
we need a lot of civil society. We need a lot the work of NGOs. But I think that we start, we need to start asking our governments answers. So what we can do in our private life is to host a migrant in our place if we want is to be part of an NGO like Josiane on organization like Josiane Roberto to be practically active in changing something but for all the others who can rightly decide not to be part of anything and to be just a citizen I mean we have one right to be represented in a representative democracy which is the vote and voting someone means asking them solution for something we perceive as, as something to be solved or as something to be managed and migration is for me as a voter as a citizen something to be managed something to be understood this is what we can do this is what we have to do questions if an agreement lies we we have not to stop question and answer on the reason why there is a lie on that paper which has been not voted by our italian parliament is a lie the first sentence of that agreement says that in libya there are reception centers and in Libya there are no reception centers according to Libyan law not according to me so my duty what can I do keep asking to the former minister of interior of Italy which never wanted to meet me why you wrote reception centers if in Libya there are just detention centers according to the law Maybe this lie is the same reason why I couldn't be able to enter the detention center like many other colleagues for two years during your mandate. And on the basis of the answer, we can build public opinion, we can, we can build opinion, and we can decide to whom delegate the right to manage a phenomenon on the base of someone who is telling the truth or not that is very sad not seeing any sponsor there is a bit of heavy dip with babies, with adults, with children. So it would be that every day. If, if people, one, one person that, have, that is pregnant, they want to deliver that day. If they want to deliver, if they have delivered the baby finished, no hot water, nothing, nothing. If the salt water, we are going to, to go and take care of that baby. I knew it was a risk going to Italy by boat, but I was comforted deep inside of me that when I get there, I'll start a good life. I'm an orphan. I have about four younger ones. I stay with our grandmother. I'm the one that paid bills. I didn't finish school. I have to drop out because I want my younger ones to go to school. When we got to the sea, they put us into the boat. We were like sinking before the Libya police arrived. 
and I was in the safe. I was kind of scared. I was comforted by my dreams. When I get to Zugo, I go back to school and start good life again. I'm 50 years old. I'm from Nigeria. I've been in this place for seven months. This place, they beat us. They, they, they take us as if we are slaves. They flog us with a pipe. We are always inside the room. We never come out. People are dying. Many people are dying in this place. When someone died in the desert, they, we, they throw the body away. We don't bury the person. Look around, they are, still, they, they are killing people in Nigeria. My, I lost my mom, I lost my dad. I was afraid I would be suffering. Francesca, before uh, leaving you, we still have um, a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is, could you share some hard data about a migrant's contribution to European GDP? I think it would be important to introduce this kind of data in the public debate. Yes, uh, you are definitely right. I don't have them um, here because I, in my notes, I just have the, the Italian ones and on the basis of the professor Stefano Lievi, which is ordinary of sociology in Italy, and in, in the book, uh, Immigration, We Have to Change Everything, he, he precisely mentioned all the income of taxes and the works of, uh, the works of uh, um, migrants here in Italy, uh, the companies they open, the shops they open, the jobs they are giving. Uh, so this is a, a very precise work Professor Levi has done, at least uh, for Italy. And I, sometimes I share with people, yes, this data. I have no the, the world Europe figures at the moment, but definitely I will work on it. Yeah, you're right, it's very useful. Thank you, Francesca. A last question from uh, our friend, Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Um, uh, so thank you very much for this video. It's, it was uh, instructive and very, very touching, actually, because uh, it brings a spotlight uh, uh, on, uh, uh, unfortunately, on a reality here in Luxembourg, uh, um, especially with Friends of Caritas, uh, uh, probably we, we see the, the very last uh, part uh, of uh, of this movie which so people who are here for the uh, during the procedures for international protection and uh, how they interact with institutions how they interact with the people how they interact with us actually sure. so uh, that's really very instructive to also understand uh, um, what happens before which uh, uh, probably uh, we still I mean speak for myself but I still have a quite a stereotypical uh, view to defend the right of the people not to escape but to move to move to have a different life i was saying before not just a better life a different life like me if i want to go to live in uh, china or if i want to go to live i don't know in canada not necessarily a bad life another life and this is a right I think we have to defend and the other right I think we have to improve is to dignify their lives in their own countries and it's real the problem is that look at uh, Italy and Tunisia Italy and Tunisia uh, shared a lot of interest 
And our foreign ministry, no longer than three months ago, um, was, I can say, blackmailing Tunisia and giving an amount of money that is ridiculous in terms of economical agreements, which are six millions nothing. And he said during a state visit in Tunisia, I won't give you the six million if you don't stop people crossing the Mediterranean from Tunisian coast, we cannot do agreement in this way. Francesca, thank you really. Thank you very much for shedding a light on uh, the phenomenon uh, of uh, migrations. Um, thank you for uh, sharing uh, your knowledge, uh, for sharing uh, information. And this is the type of journalism that we really like. We believe uh, that only by knowing we can make the right decisions. And thank you for reminding us that we should always uh, question ourselves. We should always question uh, our government's decisions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Grazie.